product for the AIML platform at Capital One, and previously I was head of product for Kubernetes at Google. I've served as the chair of the CNCF governing board, and this is my third KubeCon keynote, but my first one as an end user. You know, at Google, it was clear that AI was at an inflection point with the invention of the transformer and with AlphaGo. But back then, machine learning was really still a niche technology. It was used by specialist data scientists for very specific use cases. It's only recently that with generative AI, we've started to see impressive generalized knowledge and even basic reasoning capabilities in these models, which then makes them generally useful for a broad range of use cases. And so therefore, generative AI now has the potential to be mainstream where machine learning was niche and generative AI can be on par with game-changing technologies like the internet and mobile. It also comes with a more natural human interface, so it applies to a broader range of users, for example, with audio, image, and video. And in banking, where I now work, there are hundreds of use cases. For example, in customer service, we can use generative AI to automate the work of our customer service agents and eventually automate a lot of the work for self-service. We also are using it already for our engineers to automate many parts of the coding process. And perhaps most importantly, generative AI is very useful in automating mundane tasks in the back office and making many of our functions more productive, all the way from finance to HR to risk. And the cool thing is there's just a few primitives that you need, semantic search, summarization. These are the workhorses for things like document understanding and contract review. Fortunately, Capital One has been at the forefront of machine learning technology for a number of years. In fact, Capital One was founded as a information-based company, so really a data and technology company that operates in banking. And over time, the founders of Capital One have invested very early in going all in on cloud, and so we have a modern technology stack. We've also invested a lot in our talent. In fact, we're rated as number one in banking for our generative AI talent. But that's not all. We've made some good choices along the way. We've selected Kubernetes and a number of open source components uh, to bring in-house and use for our platforms. And that's not because of some religion around open source. We selected open source because it actually helps us with our regulatory stance. We're in a regulated industry, and it helps us really control over our platforms. And we don't only use open source, we also use, wherever possible, managed services so that we can automate the toil. But we like to build on top of that, and our desire is to differentiate and always build tailored solutions instead of generic ones, and that's something that open source enables. We've not only benefited from Kubernetes, we've also contributed back to open source, and these are just some of our contributions to Kubeflow. We've also contributed to other projects, uh, notably OpenTelemetry, and we have open source engineers on our teams. So now I want to switch gears and talk about machine learning platforms and how an enterprise could build a machine learning platform using some of those open source projects that we just saw. Well, at the base layer, you have compute, which hopefully you run Kubernetes on, and you have data and a number of data services. Since you're running Kubernetes, you can then bring in a number of operators, and primary for machine learning are, of course, the Spark operator and the Kubeflow operator. These are the workhorses here, but this architecture is very modular, and so you can bring in many other operators as your needs change or as you want to cater to specific types of workloads. In fact, you can bring in operators for proprietary cloud services and plug those in as new, new services evolve. For machine learning, you essentially have the development time, which is the training environment, and then you have the serving environment. And you go from training to serving using a CI-CD pipeline. You could often use Argo for that. And you have a model registry and a feature registry that you use to store and extract the artifacts from. This is a very versatile platform. It caters to data analysts through notebooks, 
It can also cater to data scientists, of course, who want to create more complex workflows and pipelines using Kubeflow training pipelines. On the serving side, it serves many masters. So you have finance who wants to do batch ETL. And then you have fraud, which needs to do more real-time serving. So you can serve many different types of models on the same platform, again, using Kubeflow serving. At the top, you have a multi-tenant control plane. This can be made, made up of customized components as well as open source components that do authorization, store secrets with Vault, uh, do cost optimization and cost monitoring with KubeCost, and a number of observability and governance and compliance controls. We like such a platform because it allows us to meet our regulatory needs and bring in regulatory controls as needed and customize them. So what about when you want to run generative AI on this platform? Well, it kind of falls short. There are a number of additional constraints that generative AI uh, brings into the picture. First of all, it's not just data analysts and data scientists. Now you also have software engineers who want to use generative AI capabilities and plug them into their applications. You also have to cater to non-technical operations teams that are going to create golden data sets and are going to evaluate the outputs of your generative AI systems. And the use cases are fundamentally different, whereas for machine learning, the use cases were mostly numerical, decisioning systems, recommendations, and anal analytics. In the case of generative AI, the use cases are much more unstructured data, you know, content generation using text and images, customer engagement using voice and text, and then, of course, code for engineering. Also, the risk is different with generative AI. These generative AI models are much more general purpose, and the outputs are very statistical. And in a regulated environment, you really have to control for all of this risk. So what are we to do? Well, we can extend the machine learning platform. There are some basic things we can do. First of all, on the compute layer, you have to add GPU capacity and high-performance clusters. With that, you can then do fine-tuning of some of the open source models in the same Kubeflow training environment. You can potentially also do extended pre-training. If you add an AI gateway, you can bring in external models that are um, from proprietary third parties. But that's not really enough to cater to the needs of software development, developers that are going to want to build sophisticated generative AI applications. And so you have to add a number of new generative AI services. And I'm going to illustrate those here. Clearly, these services include foundation models, both open source hosted ones as well as closed source ones that you can bring in using an AI gateway. You also need embedding models. And on the data side, you need vector stores and potentially knowledge graphs to improve your accuracy. There's a huge amount of work to be done on the data preparation pipeline, taking the unstructured data, chunking it for the vector databases, cleaning up that data, you know, providing a metadata on top of the unstructured data so that you can actually govern that data well. These are things that you need to prepare from a data services perspective. And then there's a set of layers that are to be built on top so that software engineers can easily create Gen AI applications. Some of the basic ones I mentioned, search, and summarization. So retrieval augmented generation is a box here, and that's something that you want to make available in this platform for general purpose use. Also, safeguarding the inputs and outputs to those generative AI applications requires a set of enterprise guardrails that are customizable for different use cases. And you may want to provide templates so that it's easy to get started. That's for the basic types of applications. To enable more Agentic applications on the same platform, there's another set of primitives, chat memory, caching, a prompt assembler, and the ability to plug in different APIs and tools that might be required. And then finally, for the operations team, an end-to-end -end evaluation test harness. These are some of the basic components that are required. And to make this platform easy to use, there's an application orchestration layer, or almost a PaaS layer, that goes along with this. So as you can see, here, we've built essentially a whole PaaS, a platform on top of the machine learning platform that itself was built on Kubernetes. And in fact, if I think back to my old Kubernetes days, that's what we set out to do, is to build a platform for platforms. There's a choice here, of course, whether to use closed source or open source AI, even in the foundation of this platform. 
If you use closed, closed source, you can actually get most of this platform, or many aspects of it, as a closed source platform, and there's very little work to be done. And that gives you time to market, so you can go live much faster. But on the other hand, the open source models have really started to catch up with proprietary models, and so now you have the ability to create a platform in-house that's far more customized and tailored to your needs. And so that is something that gives you more control and more choice. But of course, to build that platform requires an open source community and a number of components that are yet to be invented. This is an emerging landscape of components. And while there are some powerful capabilities here, this is also an opportunity for this community to innovate and create new components that can be used to power that PaaS. So with that, you know, I want to look back as a longtime Kubernetes community member, I've been amazed by what this community has created, both in terms of the technology with Kubernetes and the ecosystem of other projects, but also in terms of the culture of open source. We have taken what was potentially a limited game to a positive sum game. And I think now we have the opportunity to do that again in AI. And I hope that we'll build that path together for everyone. Thank you.